Thanks very much. It's very bright, and I'm slightly overawed by that introduction. Um, uh, great. Slides. Excellent. Hello. Um, I'm Tassa Stevens. I'm one of the co-directors of CONI. Um, and my background, I'm a, I've got a doctorate in psychology. I'm a theatre maker and a wrangler. Um, and just to sort of tell you a little bit more about CONI, CONI is a collective agency making play for people. Anything, basically, which people can play, literally anything. It can happen in theatres, out on the streets, in palaces. Uh, we use digital, but digital in a very kind of lo-fi way, pretty much just to kind of glue together the experience of people talking to them, playing them, so that wh wherever they are, it can be happening. The experience kind of starts whenever they first hear about it. Um, we're a collective agency, which kind of means we can be anybody. Um, our HQ assembles teams from a network of artists and makers, a network which itself plays like a game of secret society, where we take code names and are led by a mysterious agent called Rabbit. I didn't just say that. Um, all of this is kind of a way of saying that Coney is an organisation um, that kind of strives basically to be playful itself, to be as it does, as best as possible. It itself is a project, and I'll be talking through some of our other projects in a sec. Um, we follow, um, in Making Play, kind of a set of principles, which include adventure, curiosity, reciprocity, and loveliness. I'll be talking about loveliness in a little bit more depth later. These are actually a fairly good practical guide to making good play, as we've discovered. I mean, and these, you know, take, make no kind of claim for these. If anything, these are reinventing wheels. Um, gaming for good. Now, I must confess to a certain sceptical twinge at this phrase. It's the same twinge I get when someone says, reality is broken, let's fix it with game. But at least it's not like the kind of absolutely crushing soul ache I get when someone says gamification without any irony at all. They are, and you can quote me on this, the clinically inhumane. I mean, it's kind of, to kind of go back to reality is broken, it's kind of like if only reality could play more like a really well-designed game, then everything would be better. Well, this is a well-designed game. It's called Jetpack Joyride. It's for the iPhone. And um, as much as I've been playing it somewhat addictively recently, I thoroughly recommend it. You're in a game reality where you're flying a jetpack. Um, you're scattering little scientists. That's a little scientist um, there being scattered um, and um, collecting kind of all kinds of stuff in a bit of a kind of repeating Groundhog Day. It's brilliantly juicy. Like everything that you do and every kind of way that you change the way you want to play it is kind of rewarded, as you can see by all of this stuff up there. Um, but we don't live in such a well-designed reality, which is fortunate if you're one of those scientists. Um, and I just kind of wonder how is it possible for our broken reality to change to one that is kind of as well-designed as this, um, and kind of what that would mean. Because, I mean, and there's kind of some, something, I think this is just so blindingly basic. Obviously, in reality, we're all playing lots of different games. And like the challenge to try to get lots of people to play anything, lots of people for whom even the word game makes them run a mile, thought that's for kids. Um, how to get people to kind of agree on the rules. And where a game world where that entire reality is built to serve that entirely. We're in kind of like a very kind of disparate and kind of like confusing kind of reality. But there is, I mean, if it's possible, then we'd have to be able to do it to change things kind of one step at a time. And there is a process of change. Um, and it's really the change that happens in the people that play it. And can, I'm interested in kind of like what that process is. Also sort of at the heart of my kind of like sceptical twinge is kind of the difference between the kind of charismatic message and the nuanced message. People who say gamify and do better are pretty charismatic. They're selling you an outcome. Um, that's why they make so much money. Um, whereas, you know, something to say, there's a process of change and it's one step at a time and it might not work, but it's worth a go. Um, that's not, that's more nuanced. That's not quite as charismatic. But I think that it's all about the process of playing. Um, here's Super Me, which as Matt says is one of the games, it's actually a game of a set of games and other stuff 
that was commissioned by Alice Taylor at Channel 4 Education when she was there, um, that something else Paul Bennon's in the audience preloaded and Coney kind of made together. Um, it's about resilience for teens. I was talking about it yesterday with someone who was very sceptical about its promise to kind of fix people um, by playing. And I kind of agree. I mean, it's, I mean you, you, we, could, we were saying with this, you will get better by practicing resilience through playing this stuff. And it's kind of more, a little bit more like, this might not work, but it's worth having a go. And as long as you stay clear-sighted about what's happening, then even the process of having a go will do you good. And it, I mean, it has done good. I mean, the evaluation that kind of, kind of following up the Channel 4 commissioned showed with a massive set of teenagers that they were coming back to it and they were kind of like that this basic message was, kind of like was, was sticking with them. Um, it's about resilience. And I kind of led, led the research on this for Super Me and um, based it on a framework of resilience, which is kind of about how we respond well to change and this process of change itself. And there's dimensions that can, like, I think, kind of characterise it that we used for Super Me. Um, agency, your sense of self, that your actions have consequence. Relatedness, your connections with people and the strength of your relationships. Ad adaptability, how you get better at the things that you're good at. Kind of active learning at its best. And all powered by reflection, the process of seeing clearly and paying attention. And this framework... I confess I'm finding pretty indispensable for thinking about all play. And I'd argue that these are all kind of pretty much the dimensions of what, when something is intrinsically worth doing for itself, not for points or for prizes. I'm going to quickly talk through some projects of, of, of Coney and how, I mean, and I could pick this list thinking about which of these could possibly be said to be for good. And then actually just kind of just, just point, thinking about it kind of from this kind of framework kind of point of view. Um, so, there's a few things we've made that have been really about actively, players actively learning about something, and through the play, um, then um, that's how they kind of get better at something. With the new game that we've made for Channel 4, uh, Nightmare High, um, again with something else, and Player 3, um, also about resilience, but about resilience in the kind of transition from going from, from primary school to secondary school for 10 to 13 year olds. Um, and we've embedded as best as we can the resilience into the mechanics of the game world. So you hopefully will get better simply by playing because that, you're going through those, those same processes. It's active learning, which as an ex-psychologist I can tell you is the best. Um, the rubbish game was a live game that we made for the Science Museum. I mean, it, was, yeah, it wasn't that rubbish a game. Um, it was about rubbish, about the challenge of household, household waste management, the three R's of reduce, reuse, and recycle. And again, again we embedded the learning in the, in the mechanics of the game. And the evaluation afterwards showed that um, a significant minority, um, but still significant, 20% of players were basically trying to change the behavior of the people that they lived with and their friends and their family based on what they kind of learned from playing. Um, Adventures in Learning is a whole strand of Coney's work. Um, and this is a particular example, A Cat Escapes, co-produced at Batsy Art Centre, where a class of eight-year-olds become heroes in an adventure, helping a cat who they're emailing, because as we all know, cats can type, um, escape from imprisonment by enthusiastic Egyptologists who are going to take away to ancient Egypt at the end of, basically the end of term. Luckily, the kids didn't realise that coincidence. And... Um, it's basically prison break for a cat um, in episodes, where each episode has a challenge with a bit of the curriculum very literally embedded in it. So here, they're, um, they're working out how she can build a tower out of newspaper drinking straws and sellotape that will help her reach a high window that might be the way out. Uh, I don't know if you can read it from here, but the little words that say, you go on here with an arrow and a picture of a cat is possibly the favourite thing that I've ever received um, from making something with Coney, that done by an eight-year-old. Um, here, uh, it's their agency that's the most important thing. We've kind of broken the game of it because whatever they do, it's always just good enough. We rewrite the story and retell the story responsibly, incorporating whatever it is that they have done so that it's just successful, keeping it, hopefully, as exciting as an adventure. And 
what we're, can, we're developing a new project um, of this model out in uh, Australia, um, and we're going to be running some sort of academic e evaluation on it as well. But it, I mean, I would kind of hazard that the motivation to learn goes up tenfold from what we've kind of seen. Here's something called the Harrogate Challenge Match, which was commissioned by Harrogate Local Authority to make a game around user-centred service design for a group of young people um, around substance misuse services. Now here, um, we over-designed the game, um, and it, it kind of, they kind of want, they, they sort of stopped playing the game bit of it. What was more important to them was their agency, again. That they, the fact that people were actually listening to them for the first time, and that they had possibly some agency in changing the way these services were built, it was way more important to them than the mechanics of a game. Um, Small Town Anywhere, which um, Matt mentioned, which is theatre for a playing audience who becomes citizens in a small town at war with itself. It's a story that responds to the changes, so the choices that they make in their play individually and collectively. Um, and there's, there's an awful lot that kind of goes on in this piece. Um, um, but I'm kind of always mindful of the importance of reflection. And we actually built a space for reflection very directly into the experience, so they couldn't leave straight away after leaving the town. Um, one town in particular that sticks in the mind, where one player became so wrought in the game of becoming mayor that he didn't notice that the trap was closing around him. Um, and, you know, in his own words afterwards, very beautifully and generously reflecting, that seeing how there was a fascist state rising up around the town, and he didn't really notice, and he drove the town off the moral cliff. Uh, leading a lynch mob, um, and it's taken him kind of a long while to kind of get to get, kind of get over that. But that without that, refle that that reflection point is the most important part of the impact that that play had. Um, the loveliness principle. Um, I said there was a loveliness principle. Um, this is a piece actually, um, although there is also a principle of loveliness. Um, this piece is about it. It's basically a hunt which challenges the players who find it into small acts of loveliness for strangers, um, including, for example, reverse pickpocketing anonymous messages of loveliness into people's bags and coats before, if they find the end, they find kind of what's at the heart of that. Um, principle, of, principle of loveliness, um, I think, is about making a gift um, that is surprising and delightful and considered. It's not a random act of kindness. Um, and this piece has been remade in very many different places. This is actually from when it was made um, in Shoreham by Sea, just up the road, but ma made in a way that was for Shoreham um, and involving local people from Shoreham in its making and its operation and trying to gift as much agency as possible. Um, you remember perhaps the society kind of that I talked about at the start. Um, I went to Melbourne earlier this year and ran a playful secret agent training program, which did pretty much what it said on the tin. Um, here's the fictional classified ad um, that people responded to, and inadvertently recruited a great number of agents to the Society of Coney kind of through this, of all different backgrounds. Part of the training was this anonymous gifting of, like, of messages and presents um, to strangers, and it, it mushroomed all over the week, like a really unexpected and like, surprising for me how much people were kind of like just going for it. It was kind of a gifting spreading like wildfire. And I kind of reflected that in this that there was kind of a whole bunch of accidental circumstances and um, that kind of made this kind of catch light. And there's kind of quite a lot to do with what we might call the rules of the play space, um, which I think are probably more important than the rules of the game. Um, and just as in this research that I read a while ago, which shows that um, people who have been to the theatre um, uh, when they go to the theatre, are far more concerned paying attention to the whole building of the theatre and how they enter it and all the other people that are there. It takes them five goes before they start concentrating on the play itself. And I think here, how people enter the play space, what the rules of the play space are, how do I join in, why are you asking me to play, who are you anyway, what do you want from me, can I bring a friend, who is paying for this, are you for real? These, these kinds of questions and more are kind of a way more important to, kind of to bring people into this place. And actually, if these are not, the answers for them are not right, then nothing good is going to happen. Um, and you're, every time you're kind of making a game with rules, 
each rule is kind of like a little negotiation you have to ask of people. Do you want to play this way? And again, and each time, then that negotiation works um, if people are, going to, are actually going to play. And I think, I mean, I've been really inspired, and that's not sort of like sort of hubristic, because I have like kind of discovered this more than invented, about the Lovey's principle and about kind of making a gift and how that is kind of just so important. And that the Society of Coney, we got wrong for a while. It was a space that Coney tried to control and own. And as much as possible, and yeah, everybody who works in digital media will go, yeah, yeah, right, of course, yeah, you, you dimwit. Um, it has to be like an open space. You have to give things away. You have to be a host, the best host that you can be. But there's nothing more than that, or it's everything's kind of in that. And it's how to kind of gift agency with as few strings attached as possible. None, if you possibly can. Um, and we're just about getting to grips with this, but I think it's going to have quite a major effect on the way that we make work um, and think about, think about the rules of the play spaces that we're creating, um, wherever those may be. Um, I think that's probably it. I'm melting up here. I don't know how you are. Um, that's that. Thanks very much. You've been lovely. <laughs>